There's an old story about a pastor who was told that a widow in his church claimed to have visions during which she said she talked to Jesus. The pastor decided he needed to stop that nonsense dead in its tracks. He thought of an innovative way to prove to her that her discussions with Jesus were just figments of her imagination. The next time the pastor saw the widow, he said, By the way, the next time you see Jesus, would you please tell him to tell you all about my sins, my own sins, and my own life that no one knows about? And then be sure and call me when he tells you. A week or two went by, and the phone rang. The widow called the pastor and was telling them she'd talked with Jesus again. The pastor said, really? Well, did he tell you about my sins that no one knows about? The widow said, I asked him. And Jesus said, he couldn't remember your sins. Hello and a warm welcome to the audio teaching ministry of CWR, Christianity Without the Religion. I'm Greg Albrecht. Here at CWR, our audio teaching ministry, Jesus is always in our spotlight. He is always front and center. He always occupies center stage, or that is at least our desire, and we attempt to do so by God's grace, because he keeps drawing us back to himself, because His mind is such that it sets our focus on Him, the Son of God, the eternal Word of God. And He brings us back often to the topic of forgiveness today. And this week, we're discussing set free from sins, based on our keynote passage in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. Let us prayerfully now prepare to receive the grace of God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for giving us even as and when we fail to share and pass on that same forgiveness you've so generously and graciously granted us. We are staggered. We are humbled by your forgiveness, and we pray you would continue to teach us about this incredible aspect of your love, that your forgiveness is forever. In Jesus' name we pray, forever and ever. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. Breaking into the middle of a thought, which is what you always do when you read any passage of a book, halfway through, two-thirds of the way through, without its context, and we'll try to get some of that context and be reminded of it momentarily. But first, let's just read the passage that will serve as our keynote passage and direct our thoughts in our message today. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. Now, before going on in the next two verses, this is a reference to the early tabernacle and the old covenant and the ceremonies and rituals which were proscribed and stipulated under that covenant. So let's go back and read verse 13 again, then continue on with verses 14 and 15, because I rudely interrupted our reading. I'm sorry for that. Verses 13 through 15 of Hebrews chapter 9, once again, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more, then, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve 
the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Our passage and the entire New Testament and all of the gospel of Jesus Christ teach us that God forgives because of the cross of Christ. Forgiveness is imparted to you and me because of the blood of Jesus who redeemed and purchased us with his blood. But what was this blood of Jesus all about? Because it's intricately rooted in the idea of being set free from sins, which is a topic of our message today, the title of our message and the topic, and of course intricately rooted in the Old Covenant itself. What was this blood of Jesus all about? Well, here's the kind of pat answer offered within most of Christendom today. And much of this pat answer is true, but much of it is pretty much misleading as well. But let's sort of examine the pat answer. What was the blood of Jesus all about? You and I are sinners. We deserve to die because we offended God. Now, again, I'm not saying this, okay? I'm giving you a pat answer. Then we're going to talk about the pat answer. So let's go back to the pat answer once again, because I keep rudely interrupting myself, as it turns out. (laughs) Maybe that's one of the signs of becoming a little older. I don't know. So here's the pat answer offered by religious systems and methodologies to the question, what was the blood of Jesus all about? You and I are sinners. We deserve to die because we have offended God. God's never happy with sin, and because you and I are sinners, he's not happy with us until the penalty of our sins is paid. But the wages of sin is death. So the only way God would be happy with sinners would be for sinners to die. Well, that's kind of twisted, isn't it? God's only happy with... Now I'm commenting myself on the pet answer, so this is not the pet answer. They're not going to say it's twisted. So I'm saying... Hey, that's kind of twisted, isn't it? God's only happy with us when we die. That way we don't cause him any more grief. Okay, the pat answer of Christless religion continues. So, says Christless religion, somebody has to die. Who could die for the sins of the whole world? Whose life would be worth paying for the sins of the whole world? Well, of course, God himself. So Jesus, the Son of God, who was and is God, came to this earth to make the Father happy. God the Father would only be happy if blood was spilled if death happened. So, to spare us the death we so richly deserve, God the Son, Jesus, took the hit. He substituted for us. Now, as I said, there's some truth in that idea, and there's lots of error. The partial truth, blood has to be shed to forgive sin. The full truth, the idea of blood being shed was an Old Covenant stipulation. You're not going to find that in the New Covenant. According to the laws of the Old Covenant given to the nation of Israel, the blood of bulls and goats was shed so that sin could be forgiven. We read about that in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13, the first verse of our keynote passage, the blood of bulls and goats, and for good measure, the ashes of a heifer being sprinkled on you. But Jesus came to end all of that all of that. Notice again the last part of verse 15 of our keynote passage in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. Here it is. He has died, that is Jesus, as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Set free from the sins committed under the first covenant. That's what we call the old covenant. Jesus was and is the unblemished Passover lamb of God because he gave his blood to set us free from the sins committed under the old covenant. Jesus gave his earthly life to terminate the old covenant. So our relationship yours and mine, 2,000 years later, 
is not based on an old covenant where God demands bloodshed before we can be reconciled with him. That's an old covenant principle, an old covenant teaching, and has no place in the new covenant. The cross of Christ is all about the institution of a new way of life. It's about a religion-less relationship with God. That's why Hebrews 10 verse 4 in the next chapter, you want to turn there and read it, says, it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. But the religion of Christendom distorts and twists the blood of Jesus. According to Christless religion, our relationship with God still really depends on our sins. God is angry with you and me when we do bad things, says Christless religion. But the gospel of Jesus Christ insists that God is not filled with wrath, demanding penalties be paid before his anger can be appeased. That idea is a pagan idea imported into the gospel that causes many in the name of Jesus Christ and in their misinterpretation of the Bible to completely misrepresent and misunderstand God. God is love. God is not about punishment, wrath, and vengeance. That's what humans are about. Let's don't get that mixed up. Let's know who God is. Let's know who humans are. Let's know what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. Let's know what religion fabricated, invented by human beings, and even the gospel as it has been edited by humans, the human version of the gospel, that's what that's all about. The cross of Christ was not God the Son appeasing the wrath of God the Father, suffering in the most horrible way possible, so that God the Father would not kill you and me and everyone else who had ever lived. The cross of Christ was the love of God, the greatest demonstration of love ever, in which Jesus willingly accepted, received, and absorbed all of the human wrath, hatred, violence, and animosity of all humans for all time. He soaked up all sin forever and ever like a sponge. Jesus didn't come to this earth filled with violence, wrath, or punitive or retributive justice. He didn't solve the problem of suffering caused by sin by going out and inflicting more suffering. He solved the problem of sin and suffering by ingesting and assimilating and terminating the penalty of all human hostility and hatred. For Jesus, the end of violence is not more violence inflicted on the guilty. For Jesus, the end of violence is the violence he accepted and assimilated on the cross. The peace of God is possible. Forgiveness is freely given because Jesus quenched the fires of the hell of hatred and vindictive resentment, and hell, that hell, burned itself out in Jesus. The love of our Lord quenched the fires of any hell that we might experience or that someone might hold over our head. But in order to be free from the power of hatred and retribution, we must accept the new life, His new life, our risen Lord, so that we might be healed from the toxic hurt and suffering, much of it caused by Christless religion. At the beginning of our message, we related the story of the widow who told her pastor that Jesus told her that he couldn't remember the pastor's sins. Now, that story introduces a fascinating question. If there is something God cannot do, doesn't that mean that he is not God? If he cannot remember, then that must mean he's not God, because by definition, there's nothing God cannot do. The answer to that question is that God chooses to forget what we have done. He, of course, can do anything he wishes. He has a perfect memory. But when it comes to his relationship with you and me, he chooses to do something we cannot do humanly. God forgives and forgets. Allow me to share four dynamic ways God forgives us and sets us free. The title of our message today, Set Free from Sin, and how he empowers you and me, to share and pass on that same forgiveness to others. 
First of all, number one, God sets us free and forgives us by using our human inability to forget to help heal us. That may be a little bit of a mind bender, but stick with me here. It's impossible for you and me to forgive and forget major issues that cause deep and severe pain to us. In fact, God often uses the memory we have of the root cause of the pain and suffering that we've endured to help us heal. Said another way, from the flip side, no lasting and real spiritual healing can take place by a denial of the past. Pretending that something never happened is not healing. You can pretend that the events that caused you pain and heartache never happened, but a fantasy, make-believe world, either in the past, the present, or the future, does not produce true and lasting healing. Remembering is actually an important part of true forgiveness. The proposition that we humans must forgive and forget is a myth. More than that, it's a fool's errand. Forgiving and forgetting is an impossible task that can actually add to shame and suffering rather than helping solve and terminate it. Remembering painful things can help us work through suffering and experience real hope on the other side. I say real hope because our memory allows us to protect ourselves and those we love from a recurrence of the factors that once caused incredible pain. We remember how painful it was when we experienced some kind of a fiery trial. And because our memory helps us avoid similar situations, we have hope that we or our loved ones, as we share our experience, bitter experience, in the school of hard knocks, will ever have to endure such a thing again. So remembering is part of healing. Remembering is actually an active ingredient allowing healing to take place. Forgiveness offers an incredible and beautiful grace, a profound and meaningful healing to the one who is forgiven, and forgiveness also acts as an agent of healing in the one who forgives. The second insight about how God forgives and sets us free and how he empowers us to share and pass on his forgiveness to others is this. Number two, confession, reconciliation, and restoration brings about healing for both parties. But the process of forgiveness often takes time. Forgiveness is not easy. It's a process. It's a product of our growth in Christ. And as we grow in His grace and knowledge, just as physical growth is often accompanied by growing pain, so too is the process of forgiveness accompanied by pain. Forgiveness is not quick and easy. It takes time to heal. The person who has been horribly hurt and damaged must eventually come to realize they must surrender their desire for revenge. They have to come to the truly Christ-centered conclusion by God's grace that they will willingly give up their power to hold a grievance over someone's head. That's why, again, it's silly and preposterous to suggest that someone should forgive and forget major hurts and suffering. Forgiveness is difficult and painful. There's a cost, but there's also a huge cost involved in refusing to forgive, and many people who refuse to forgive pay the cost of living with an open, spiritual wound that will forever fester and perhaps grow more toxic as it's infected by resentment and hatred. The person who's endured pain and suffering often wants revenge, and we find the idea of the person who hurt us going to hell appealing. But that doesn't mean that eternal torture in hell is true. Divine forgiveness confounds the fiery human fabrication of the eternal burning holes of hell because the grace of God's forgiveness teaches and imparts healing and restoration. Now here's a third principle to remember about how God forgives and sets us free and how he empowers us to share and pass on his forgiveness to others. Number three, forgiveness is not reasonable. It doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. When someone has caused you or me incredible grief and suffering, it's Logical. It makes sense to think that 
We should use the fiery power of the pain we've suffered against that person. It's logical to tell ourselves that we can't let that person who caused us so much pain get away without learning a lesson. It makes sense to tell ourselves that God would surely want us to teach the person who hurt us a lesson. But when we hang on to our resentment and anger for the time when we can pass on that pain to others, we're holding a fiery and destructive emotion in our bodies and our souls that will only burn us. As the book of Proverbs says, speaking of illicit sexual sins, one cannot take fire into one's bosom and not be burned. Refusing to forgive someone is harboring a destructive and toxic emotion that will only cause further suffering in our own life. And that's a terrible cost paid by those who refuse to forgive. You may have heard the true and wise saying that goes something like this. The act of forgiving a prisoner sets that prisoner free. And the act of forgiving also helps us realize that we are the prisoner who is being set free. And here's the fourth and perhaps the most basic and fundamental principle about God's forgiveness and how he will set us free through his forgiveness and empower us to share that forgiveness and pass it on to others. It doesn't matter whether someone asks to be forgiven or not. It doesn't matter if the person who caused incredible pain and suffering acknowledges they're wrong, because the deepest and most profound level of forgiveness doesn't involve conditions. It's here that we return to the fundamental power and strength of forgiveness Forgiveness flows out of God's grace, and God's grace and love is without condition. God loves us unconditionally. There is no end of his love and grace, and there is no end of his forgiveness. God forgave you and me long before we decided to embrace his forgiveness. Whether anyone accepts his forgiveness or not, God's forgiveness is a done deal. It doesn't matter whether someone asks to be forgiven. God's forgiveness has no conditions. Now, it's true, in order to live in the grace of God, one must embrace that forgiveness and surrender one's hate and resentment and animosity towards others. But God doesn't do so because we accept it. He's already forgiven us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for setting us free and healing us from the false notions of who you are and and how and why you forgive and from the sins committed under the first covenant and for that new covenant by the blood of Jesus, which is actually what we're all about now, not about continual forgiveness, begging you for it and applying the blood of Jesus, which has been once and for all applied to all mankind for our forgiveness. We thank you for your eternal forever forgiveness that is without condition. This we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Many, many thanks to all of you around this world. And we're on radio in many parts of this world. Many of you are picking us up directly on our website. Many others of you are listening via other means. Many thanks for allowing us to be a part of your spiritual journey in Christ. Thank you for your prayers for us, and we, of course, pray for you. Join us next week for our message titled, The Anchor Holds. We'll be looking at Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. The Anchor Holds. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join us on our website, www.ptm.org, for more spiritual nourishment that we provide through the many ministries and resources here at Plain Truth Ministries.